So it is my pleasure to have um, you and Alan, Jacob, Bomer, and Simon Hall um, to present the uh, our next paper. Um, Ewan is now at the University of Bath in the UK, Jacob um, in Bristol, University of Bristol, and Simon is an independent musician. Um, so um, their talk entitled Making Music Using Two Quantum Algorithms. So pass the floor to um, Simon here we start. Thank you. Hi guys, um, so I, I'm going to be starting off. Um, can people see my slides, hopefully, and hear me? Yeah. Great, yeah. excellent. Okay. So yeah, I'm uh, really happy to be here and it's like really uh, great to be involved in this conference. It's totally different to what I'm uh, used to doing, but you know, that's always fun. So yeah, I'm going to be telling you today about um, making music using two quantum algorithms. So this came out of a project led by you and Alan as part of his doctoral prize fellowship, which he held at the University of Bristol. Um, and it was done uh, within Cat Labs, which is the group that I'm in and which Ian was in, uh, in collaboration with uh, sort of the wider science team who helped like inspire some of the ideas about this project. And uh, you're also going to hear later from Simon Small, who is a musician and a music producer, who will tell you a little bit about his side of the project. Um, so yeah, what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about the research that we do in Bristol so that you have an idea of like where we were coming from approaching this project. Uh, and then talk about how, how we approached it and like what we wanted to achieve. And then we made two tracks. So one uh, called Random Walks, inspired by uh, discrete time quantum random walks, and one called Grover's Song, inspired by Grover's algorithm. And so I'll tell you a little bit about the physics background of uh, these concepts. And then I'll hand over to Simon, who'll tell you about like his experience with the project and how he turned the data we gave him into music. So first, um, Bristol, which is uh, where sort of this project was based, is a lovely city in the southwest of England. We're host to the International Hot Air Balloon Festival, which means that lots of pictures of Bristol have uh, all these hot air balloons in the sky, which is always very nice. And also this uh, famous suspension bridge, uh, the Clifton Suspension Bridge. Um, so here we are in the, in the southwest of England. Uh, it's famous for lots of other things, but one I highlight today since we're talking about the arts is the artist Banksy and lots of his work uh, appears on the streets of Bristol because uh, Bristol is where he sort of originally came from. Okay, so in our group in Ket Labs in Bristol, the thing that we're most famous for is integrated quantum photonics. So integrated photonics is where we uh, take structures which guide light in the same way that optical fibers guide light, but we integrate these onto chips. So these chips are very similar to the kind of chips that power your computer, but instead of moving around electricity like a computer chip, we manipulate light. And then what makes this quantum is that we generate and manipulate quantum states of light, like photons and entangled photons. So in this slide, I've just highlighted a few of the results from the group from the uh, past few years, which I think are particularly exciting. But I won't go into any detail, but you know, we've made like complicated entangled states and hypergraph states. We've set records for like measuring squeezing and generating pure photons. And you know, you can ask me about this later or you know, look at these references, whatever, for more detail. Um, if you came to visit us, this is the kind of thing you would see. So we have these, these chips where we uh, have our experiments and these are very small, like only a few millimeters across. And then the whole experiment with all its sort of supporting equipment fits on a single desk. So if any of you've been like on a lab tour, particularly like an optics lab or like any physics lab really, you'll see these huge optical tables and they have all these components on and it sort of takes up a whole room. Whereas for us, it's sort of one desk. And so in the lab that I work in, this is my desk. And there's like 10 or 20 other experiments all happening at the same time in the same room. So it's quite a fun place to work. And we also have some cool bits of kit, which we use to detect uh, photons, one photon at a time. And these sit in these cryostats, which are less than one degree above absolute zero. So it's quite a fun place to work. Uh, but obviously that's not what I'm gonna be telling you about anymore today. Uh, I'm gonna be telling you about uh, making music. Um, and so I guess, um, the point of this project is to try and make music which can communicate quantum concepts. But, you know, we hit this challenge, which has already been touched on a lot today, which is, you know, music is kind of classical data. That's certainly how I see it. Um, a lot of music is discrete. And so we have this kind of challenging question, which we're all attempting to address, which is like, which systems can communicate quantum concepts through their classical measurement data? 
and you know and therefore like which we can map nicely to music and so there's a whole bunch of ideas that we came up with and we, we investigated and we talked about working on and so i've listed a few of the ones that we thought about but that we didn't pursue then i'm going to tell you um about the ones that we have actually made some music from so one is the discrete time quantum walk and the other is grover's algorithm and interestingly uh both of these concepts were uh, already touched on in the first session today. Okay, so random walks. Um, so we deal with light in our research. And one way that people realize random walks with light is that you take these waveguides, which guide light, and you place them very close to each other. And that means if you inject light into one port, it's able to tunnel from one waveguide to another one. And this tunneling happens continuously. And so you get this thing, which is known as a continuous time random walk. And there's a, a nice paper from several years ago from our research group where they demonstrated uh, continuous random walks with like entangled states of photons. Uh, but what we thought is for making music, it makes more sense to think about a discrete time random walk. And so the big picture that I want you to have in your heads for this is that of stepping stones. So, you know, when you're walking across stepping stones, you want to be in these specific discrete locations or you're going to fall into the river. And so, you know, this is what I want to have in your mind. And then there's this additional concept. So when we were designing our algorithms and our melodies, we didn't want to be able to stretch out forever to the right or to the left in this walk or like forwards and backwards. So we added a periodic boundary condition, which is just a sort of like mathematical way of saying that our walk, uh, our stones for our stepping stones are placed in a circle. Okay, so now we have this concept, we want to turn it into music. And so we have this circle of stepping stones that we're going to perform a random walk across. And we just assign a note to each stone. And then we have these rules for how we're going to do a random walk. At each, each time we want to play a note, we flip a coin. If it lands on heads, and I have this extremely accurate depiction of a coin showing heads, we take a step to the right. And if it lands on tails, we take a step to the left. And so, you know, we've got notes assigned to each step. Let's say we started on our like C5 and we've got this C natural minor scale here. If we see heads in our coin toss, we're going to play a B flat four. If we see tails, we're going to play D5. So this is all classical. And we're going to have these kind of dynamics that we saw earlier where we only move one step at a time in our melody. So we can hear this in our melody because, you know, we'll have this pattern of each note will only increment like one step at every new note. Now we wanted to think about the quantum version of this. And so how do we make our classical system quantum? Well, you know, the answer is that you just sort of draw kets around everything and everything that is an instruction, we now need to make it into a quantum operation. So our coin flip is the Hadamard gate. So we map tails to this superposition of heads and tails, this balanced superposition and tails is also a balanced superposition, but with like the opposite parity, the opposite phase. Then we have this movement operator, which is, you know, this act of like looking at the outcome of your coin toss and then taking a step. If we want to write this down in terms of our bras and kets, um, we have this operator. So here, you know, if we label our sites with integers instead of with notes, we see that if we see the heads outcome, we're going to take a step to the right, like increase our index. And if we see the tails, we're going to decrease our index. And then our periodic boundary condition appears here with this mod operation. So when we mod 14, that you know we've got 14 sites, that means if we want to take a step beyond the last site, we're going to go back to the beginning. And if we want to go like a site smaller than the first site, we're going to go to the end. Okay, so I'll just sort of tell you, I don't know, the story of what happens in this quantum random walk. So after one step, what's going to happen? We'll have applied the Hadamard operation to our coin, we've flipped our coin, and then we'll apply this move operation. And we're going to be in a state that looks like this. So we're going to have some possibility of being at the D5 site and showing heads and, or maybe tails, I might flip this around. And we're gonna have the B flat four site showing tails, or whatever. And then we're now in this entangled state. So the reason this is entangled is that if we want to completely understand what's going on in our system, we need to describe the coin and the site together. We can't consider them separately. So this is why we call it entangled. If we continue applying this operation again and again and again, our state starts to move around. So after the second step, we might have taken two steps one way or two steps the other way, or we might have taken a step one way and a step back again. And so there's sort of four possible uh, scenarios we might find ourselves in. And so we're now in a more complex entangled state with support over more nodes. 
And if we just continue applying this again and again and again for several time steps, we're eventually going to end up in some very entangled state where we have a possibility of appearing at any of the notes in the scale. Uh, and you know the sort of dynamics of this distribution are going to be changing and like interfering over time. But if we want to extract information from this, we need to perform measurement. And as I'm sure you will have heard, like if we measure a quantum system, we disturb it. And so if we were to measure every time step of this walk to extract information, we reduce our dynamics back to the classical dynamics that we started with. So we wanted to try and have our um, data show a difference between like a classical ra random walk and a quantum random walk. And so we did something which is what I'm going to say is like beyond what is possible in physics, but it is possible when we simulate physics. So that is looking inside the wave function without destroying it. So this is impossible in reality, uh, but in simulation, this is fine because, you know, we can just sort of do all this inside of our computers. And so by looking inside, we can sort of generate music from these complex distributions that happen after we start spreading out over many steps at once. Okay, yeah, and then the second thing that I will tell you about is our other song that we made, Grover's song, which is based on Grover's algorithm. So this is a sort of different concept, but there's some like similar themes here. So Grover's algorithm is applied to the problem of unstructured search. So what I want you to think about is, imagine that there was a phone book and you wanted to look up someone's phone number and you know, you know their name, but this phone book is not in alphabetical order. In fact, it's in like completely random order. How are you gonna find where they are in the phone book? Like there's no better strategy than just reading all of the names that you see in the phone book until you get to the name that you're looking for. And so on average, you're going to have to check 50% of the names in the phone book before you find them. So this sort of scales linearly. The amount of time you'll have to spend looking scales linearly with the number of names in the phone book. Now, if instead our phone book was actually a quantum oracle, which would be quite convenient, we could apply this oracle along with this uh, Grover diffusion operator, and we only need to apply this oracle square root times the number of names in the phone book before we're likely to see uh, the name that we're looking for. So we have this like quantum speed up. So this is sort of why people get excited about Grover's algorithm, and it's you know a very popular thing in the quantum algorithm literature. So. We wanted to turn this into some music. And so what we considered is applying Grover's algorithm to just three qubits. So this has the nice property that three qubits can be in one of eight states shown on the bottom of this graph here. And so eight with eight states, we can easily uh, map this to eight notes of a scale. And then we looked at the probabilities of measuring these different eight, these eight different states at each slice of the algorithm. So we sort of imagine that instead of performing the whole algorithm, we perform the algorithm up to some stage, and then we did the measurement there. And so each stage we sample from this probability distribution and then use this to generate our notes. And then what we find is with Grover's algorithm, as we run the algorithm, eventually we're going to hit a single note, which is going to be the outcome that we were searching for towards the end. Okay, so I haven't really told you much about how we made our music. I've just told you about how we generated our data and how we might think about that as music. And really in practice, what this meant is that, you know, the people who were quantum researchers on this project generated text files of random numbers, and then we sent them to Simon and we uh, let Simon turn them into music. And so what I'm gonna do now is hand over to Simon, who's gonna tell you about his experience on the project and how he turned our text files into tracks. Thanks. Thanks, Jake. All right, let me just share my screen. Do, 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 do. All right, everyone see that okay? Lovely. Okay, my name's Simon. I'm a producer, audio engineer, musician, composer, songwriter, all the normal music jobs that you bundle together. Um, I work for a studio in East London. I've worked with clients like Dire Straits, the Japanese band Mono, Lee Mead, people like Universal Records, some advert stuff, for people like Porsche. So quite a, I work with quite a variety of clients really, but I also write and record and perform my own music. Um, one of the 
particular musical ventures I have is experimental electronic music. And I like to use sort of, I like a lot of atonal music, basically. I like a lot of drone music and sort of ambient, explorative, uh, using things that aren't meant to make music to make music. Um, so that's, that's something I'm quite interested in personally. I also write for Sound on Sound, which is a recording magazine. And I mostly write about effects, uh, techniques, recording techniques, things like that. Things that I think people like me would find interesting. So that's about me. Uh, I've known Ewan, Ewan Allen, for a long, long time. And we used to play music together. Um, I can't say it was particularly amazing, but it was music. And uh, but as we sort of grew in our, each of our professions, we always talked about collaborating. And uh, one day we just had this sort of thought about how it would be to hear Ewan's scientific experiments. And for me, that was very exciting. As I mentioned, I'm particularly into making music from things that aren't supposed to make music, whether that's like, you know, hitting a big spring or physics data. You know, these are things that I find very interesting. And it's something twigged for us that day when we talked about hearing the experiments. And after that, we were just finding ways to do it. How, like, how can we make this possible? And it took about a year for us to get around to it because we were both quite busy and, you know, there was a lot of brainstorming involved. But we eventually ended up on this project and uh, we had a great science team and uh, really sort of, it was great to just get stuck into this idea that we came up with one day to hear the experiments and whether it'd be interesting. And like, it's, it was interesting for us, but we always wondered if other people might find it interesting, whether scientists would find it interesting to hear the differences on the things they work on, whether scientists would find it useful even. And also for non-scientists like me, I am not a scientist. <laughs> I am very much a musician. But for me, I found it a lot easier to understand these things that you and tell me about once we got it into musical terms. So as Jake mentioned, uh, the team sent me a collection of text files from their experiments. And it was up to me to sort of take this raw data and really work out how I could process that into something musical or something I could even use to start with. So um, I used the program MaxMSP, which is a, a sort of visual programming language, uh, mostly used by musicians and multimedia. Uh, it does video as well, I believe. And uh, it's particularly good for this sort of application because it has a very good uh, sort of data side, but also it has all of the... Uh, components to actually you know communicate with music programs do things with audio it's something i i used to use a lot i used to make synthesizers with it and i used to make uh, uh not, i never did an installation but that sort of idea I was using audio with it i've always found it quite interesting so i reached out for this and uh, my patch basically consisted of uh, some resources that i found that meant i could first of all open the text file and get the data from it and so I would import the text file. You can see at the top here, there's read, open, clear. That's for opening the files. And then I would drive that data with a, essentially a metronome. So I selected 140 BPM in this example. You could turn it on and off. That meant you could start the sequence and it would tick over at a sort of regular pace rather than just being an explosion of numbers, which was not very useful. Uh, after that, it's packed up into essentially a MIDI, like a MIDI note, and just a brief explanation of MIDI that it's a universal language for communicating data between musical instruments. It's something that pretty much all, all electronic instruments and musical software from the 80s onwards has used, and it's just the universal language. So it's the obvious format to use for this. So we packed it up created the MIDI data with it, which meant I could communicate out of Max and into other programs and sent it out. And that that's essentially how we got the raw data into something that we could use to communicate between different programs, synthesizers, all sorts of things. So once I'd made MIDI files and made MIDI data, I decided to go with Ableton Live 11, which is uh, it's it's a digital audio workstation. And 
you know, a lot of the digital audio workstations are all very similar, but for me, Ableton is fantastic with MIDI and really great for composing. So that was my sort of choice of workstation for this. And uh, it's extremely simple to get from Max to Ableton. You can essentially sort of just tell them to talk to each other. And it's as easy as that. I recorded the MIDI in and then we had MIDI clips of our new quantum melodies that I could then distribute to uh, instruments. I could look at the notes. I could alter the notes. I could analyze the notes. I could do all sorts of things. It was extremely simple. So the musicality of the data was very interesting to me. I initially set up our MIDI files with our Grovers and Random Walk melodies, as I call them. And uh, I just set them up with a simple sine wave because I just wanted to hear them in their extremely basic form. And I wanted to send them to the science team as well because, you know, a really pure sine wave is just an easy way to hear what's going on. And it was, it, I found it extremely interesting. Like the differences between the walks was great. Like the classical walk only moving up and down by one step at a time was very interesting. And uh, same with Grover, like I'd been explained what Grover's algorithm was but I didn't really understand it. But once I heard it and I heard it hone in on one note towards the end of the sequence, it just made so much more sense to me. So I did have to transpose the data up a few octaves because in its very raw form, it was extremely low. It's sort of, you could feel it, but you couldn't really hear it. And I knew it was there, but you know, you couldn't hear it. So I brought it up several octaves to kind of bring it into a more musical range. And I don't think that, affected you know I, I don't think that really affected the data at all it's more just so we could hear it uh and we also quantized it because initially it was extremely atonal and whereas personally i was very into it <laughs> we were kind of shooting for more something more melodic so um yeah we quantized the data to scales which is essentially just uh only giving it the option of using notes in particular scales so you don't get any bum notes um, and like I said, I, f I just found it really interesting hearing it in its raw form, its quantized form. And I found myself, as I started the composition process, I didn't go in with any ideas whatsoever. I wanted to be totally influenced by the data melodies. I wanted the, the experiments to, this is where it gets a bit wishy-washy musical. This is like, I wanted my emotional response from those melodies to shape what I wrote for the tracks. And I wasn't sure if it was going to work, but it really... It was very interesting what I, I got personally from these different melodies. And I think what the others got as well, because I remember explaining it to the others and saying, you know, this is making like a Grover, the progression of it all just really was, it was a big build. To me, it was like the track is building. And so the whole track we made or what I made, it, it just starts off in one state and builds, 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 builds to the end of the algorithm. And to me, I, I, when I explained that to the others, I remember them being like, oh yeah, that, you know, that makes technical sense as well. But for me, it was all about how it made me feel. Uh, again, with the quantum and classical walks, I, uh, I really wanted to make them play together. And interestingly, once I uh, quantized them, they, they really worked harmonically together. I didn't alter anything. It, they just really nicely worked together. Um, in that track, I, I used a lot of panning, so putting things in left and right speakers, and I wanted to keep one walk, one set of melody in the left speaker and one in the right, so all through the track, you could pick out what you were hearing, even if they were working together. And uh, it, it, for me, that, that track really ended up being a sort of classic. For me, it was like um, Giorgio Morida and sort of, early Daft Punk, like uh, very synth based, but also very, very certainly electronic. And there were drums in there, but we kept everything very synthesized. And uh, I actually used the, uh, the, the sort of data melodies as, as all of my different parts. So I would have the main melodies and the harmonic work from it, obviously. And I created chords out of the data as well. I created pads out of the data. I created counter melodies 
using the same data but using different synthesizers um so i really tried to pull as much from the melodies as i could and not add my own well i wanted the experiments to talk and um i was very happy to to actually do be able to do that and not i just had to add a few sort of things to make sonic sense like adding some bass and things but it was all derived from the melodies um i used mainly i used serum as an instrument which is a a plug-in digital synthesizer uh, but it's just extremely customizable and it's just really easy to sort of shape the sounds i also used operator which i think was mainly for grover which is fm synthesis and then i also routed out the midi to my modular system and which allowed me to get a lot more hands-on and it was all just for different textures essentially and they those choices were all driven from my emotional response which is like everything in the tracks were all from those raw the way the raw data made me feel and yeah that resulted in two finished sort of three to four minute tracks which we and going into this experiment we didn't know what was going to come out the other side we didn't know if we were going to find things that worked find things that sounded good at all <laughs> sound things that we could turn into actual songs or whether it's just going to be noise but we actually ended up with two completely finished songs and uh on the sort of topic of composition we also from the start really wanted to include samples from the laboratory at bristol sort of you know the actual equipment that they were using every day the aspects of the lab they were using every day we wanted to really include things that if people were familiar with that equipment or familiar with that lab they could hear it and you know they would be there and that was something very exciting to get going unfortunately it was the peak of covid in the uk so i wasn't able to attend we did plan to uh, for me to attend the lab and record things with my setup but in the end it was easier for ewan to just pop in with his phone and just record everything that he thought was interesting and he sent me about 10 or 11 recordings which i cleaned up using isotope rx which is um essentially just a audio repair software but i was just getting rid of extra noise and bits and pieces and again we didn't know what we were going to discover you know like he recorded things like the key card access the Crystat compressor even like sticky doors and doormats like really sort of i'd say yeah random things you know but i actually found a lot of use of them in uh, percussion and drones and pads textures use as particularly things like the machinery like just found some really interesting textures out of them again i didn't really change them that much they're quite raw and which is kind of my aim but it really sort of adds a sort of bed of reality to it and i i, I wasn't sure it was going to work because as like i said it was very the tracks were very synthesized but somehow it, it, it married in quite nicely so that was quite exciting to include that and uh well, that's really how we came to our tracks uh we uh you can see the link on screen that's where you can find the bristol quantum music project that we did but we are starting other projects in the new year uh on a similar vein we're sort of looking at doing some similar things so if people are interested in what we're doing you know feel free to get in touch with us because we are looking at doing a couple more things and uh yeah i really appreciate being able to talk to you all thank you very much Okay, so thank you. Thank, yeah, I am here now. Um, can you um, stop sharing your screen, Simon? Yes, thank you. So um, thank thank you for this uh, very interesting uh, approach to, to composing. It's, uh, it's very nice to see this collaboration between scientists and artists, which is something that we all are doing in, in some capacity. Um, and there are, there, I think there are a couple of questions um, which I'm going to, to pick some for you. One of them is um, at some point you, you said uh, you're looking for musicality in the data. Um, uh, one of our um, uh, 
attendee is, is asking, what, what do you mean by musicality? And if you can give a more concrete example, uh, you know, wh where, where do you find this musicality in the data or is it intuitive? Or, so uh, what's your approach to, to um, that? I guess by musicality, I just mean, I wanted it almost just to, to sound musical, you know, be able to be used as recognized as a melody rather than a sort of stream of random sounds. I was looking for, yeah, a, a, a sort of moment of melody, something that made me feel something and uh, something that I could, you know, I could, uh, basically something I could hum. That's kind of what I look for with musicality. Okay. Um, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It does. But we are running out of time, guys. Um, there is only one thing. Um, where where can we uh, can we uh, listen to to the pieces that you created? Uh, is that on the link that you provided on the uh, on the last slide there? If you could if you could type it on 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 the chat, um, then the um, the participants could um, could copy and then check for themselves um, the music. Thank you. Thank you, Ewan, Jake, and Simon. It was a very interesting presentation now.